The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Coming up on the agenda. The ultimate value is one in which we have people uh, who enjoy the benefits of peace, prosperity, inclusive economic growth, and so forth. And the promise of democracy, frankly, relies on the continued deliverance of that. Then. The biggest danger comes from humans misusing these machines, not the machines getting out of control and wiping us out. That's ahead on the agenda. Why have countries such as Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan transitioned to democracy as their economies grew, whereas China, Vietnam, and Cambodia did not? That's the question at the heart of Joseph Wong's new book. It's called From Development to Democracy, The Transformations of Modern Asia. Co-authored with Dan Slater, Professor Wong teaches political science and is the Roz and Ralph Halbert Professor of Innovation at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and he joins us now. Joe, good to have you back in that chair. Terrific. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I want to start with this. This book was 10 years in the making. Mm -hmm. How come? Well, it began around about 10 years ago. Dan and I um, met for the first time, and he was presenting a paper on strong state democratization and the prospects of democracy in places like Singapore and Malaysia. Strong states. Strong states. And I was writing a paper on Taiwan uh, and South Korea, and the two of us met at a conference. We had known of each other for years, um, and we decided to start working together on this. And we wrote a paper, actually, the first paper, version of this, uh, which we published in 2013, uh, we wrote in a cafe in Madison, Wisconsin, over one weekend. And we thought, we actually wrote 18,000 words. Why Madison, Wisconsin? Well, that's where we both went to school. I oh, did my okay. PhD there, he did his undergrad there, and we thought that would be a great place to do this. And uh, it was like, you know, sort of like we had our laptop set up in a cafe, like Battleship, that game. <laughs> and we ended up writing 18,000 words in one weekend, and we thought, there might be something here. And so about a year after that, uh, after the article came out, Princeton University Press came on board and asked if we wanted to write a book version uh, of the article. And, uh, and that's when we set out to do it. And it took 10 years because, frankly, the region was just changing so much. You know, when we had first planned to have the book go to the press about five years ago, um, you know, China looked very different than it does today. Uh, Myanmar was still under the rule of a, a democratically elected Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, and I think in many ways our conclusions would have been very different had the book come out five years before. So it took a while for us to just keep pace with the kind of transformations that are occurring in the region. And maybe ultimately a good thing that it did take as long as it did because you might have written a different book five years ago. I think so. And I think the timing, frankly, couldn't be better. I mean, the debate right now and the showdown between authoritarianism and democracy is a debate that is raging and the consequences couldn't be you know more serious than they are now so it's it's a good time for the book to come out well let's compare and contrast then because you, you do tell us in the book that that as countries move towards democracy mm -hmm. some of them start in positions of strength yeah. some of them start in positions of weakness ultimately they can get to the same place mm -hmm. what's the difference between whether you start as a strong country or a weak country well, the, the, the basic argument of the book is that, at least in the Asia region, um, and we have found similar patterns in other parts of the world and at different times as well, um, that when you have a strong state undergirded by strong state institutions, a record of economic development, and importantly, a strong political party, that transitions that are initiated by those kinds of regimes and under those conditions actually lead to more stable democratic transitions, more resilient democracies over the longer term. What's the best example in your view of that? The best example, um, and what really sort of features centrally in the book, is the case of Taiwan. Um, if we go back and um, you look at the history of Taiwan's political development, this was a a regime in the 1970s and early 1980s that by any measure was um, one of the most autocratic and efficiently autocratic regimes around. And then in the mid-1980s, the opposition movement begins to foment and gain some strength. And in 1986, you have opposition leaders forming 
a political party called the Democratic Progressive Party, the, the DPP, and it was formed illegally, actually, because Taiwan was still under martial law. And at that moment, most observers around the world who, you know, watched Taiwan politics assumed that the incumbent regime, the KMT or the Kuomintang, would do what all autocratic regimes do when an opposition starts to form, which is to crack crush down. Crush them. Right, to mm -hmm. crush them. And this is what they had done for decades. Mm -hmm. Uh, and had done, you know, from the point of view of an autocrat, done very, very effectively. But what we actually see is the regime um, standing down. And a year later, martial law being lifted uh, and the introduction of elections in the early 1990s and the first uh, full and free and fair presidential elections in 1996. And so we begin to see a transition to democracy. What was puzzling and what is at the core of this book then is why would a regime concede democracy as the KMT did in the 1980s and late 1980s into the 1990s? Why would a regime concede democracy when it was so strong? Right? And what's the answer? The argument that we make in the book is that when regimes can see on the horizon darker clouds looming, that is to say they're receiving signals that they've passed their apex of power, but they're still very powerful, they're credible, they have a credible track record of economic development. Under those conditions, those regimes that are confident, confident that if they were to have elections, they would win, confident that if they were to usher in democracy, the political economy would remain stable. Under those conditions, strong parties, strong state regimes can concede democracy and concede a very stable democratic transition. The flip side of your argument, though, is, uh, well, let's go back 40 years, Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. Yeah. I mean, he thought that's where he was. Right. He called an election, didn't work out. That's right. That's so, right. So, I mean, that's potentially one argument for why a lot of places will not risk the way you've just described. Yeah, and so th that's right. And the Marcos story, I think, is really important. In fact, we begin the book in a, in a very kind of simple narrative form about what we see as a democracy through weakness scenario versus, mm -hmm. say, what we argue as a democracy through strength scenario. And the Marcos example is a perfect example of a regime that had become so weakened, right, that had passed its best before date, if you will, uh, and such that by the time that Marcos initiates any form of political liberalization, it becomes very clear that actually the regime is so thoroughly delegitimated that he really has only one option, which is to flee the country. And this is, this is what we mean by democracy through weakness, a democracy that ultimately emerges from the ashes of a collapsed autocratic regime, um, but one that is ultimately, and certainly history has, I think, demonstrated that those kinds of transitions actually result in very unstable democratic transitions. It and results... yet, who's the head of Philippines today? That's right, that's right. Well, this is, you His know, kid. this is, that's right. I mean, this is, <laughs> electoral politics does, I mean, electoral politics are electoral politics, mm -hmm. and and you know you will see, um, you will see in many cases as well a kind of authoritarian nostalgia, and so it's not entirely surprising. Um, and again, I think that in many ways that just demonstrates the kind of, you know, the quality of democracy that you want to see ensue. And if you compare that, for instance, with what we see in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, those are really enviable democracies, mm -hmm. right, on objective measures on democracy indices and so forth, these are places that are stable political orders in which we've also seen continued you know, economic prosperity. What do you think the special sauce is in those cases that mm -hmm. you just mentioned, which is apparently absent from other places which have yet to figure it out? Mm -hmm. Well, in the book, we have uh, 12 cases that we look at, and uh, we divide them into four clusters of cases, and the Examples of Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan are what we call the developmental statist cluster. And these are a, a distinctive group of political economies in the sense that they are uh, high growth economies in the post-war period. Um, they're undergirded by what many refer to as a developmental state. So you have a bureaucracy that is very strong, very capable, uh, very intent on growing their economies. These are political economies that have done a good job in reducing poverty, uh, in promoting you know, more rather than less inclusive uh, economic development. And at the helm are uh, strong political parties right? and a strong uh, ruling regime during the autocratic period. And so this really sets the stage then 
for a regime, again, that sees these signals of uh, darker clouds on the horizon, you know, electoral signals, maybe the rise in contentious politics and so forth, they see that they are no longer, you know, their hold on power is no longer unassailable. And they say preemptively and strategically, this would be the right time to concede democracy. Um, but this is a unique group of cases because, you know, for all of the, all of the reasons I've just stated, you know, high growth, strong states, strong parties. Well, you've led me nicely to where I want to go next, which mm -hmm. is China. Mm -hmm. And that is, you, you've basically put out a list there of all the things that China has, strong mm -hmm. bureaucracy, strong institutions. They've done a, uh, an incredible job reducing yeah. poverty for hundreds of millions of people, yeah. a strong regime, and yet the final thing on that checklist, and therefore a preparedness or a willingness to yeah. take a risk on democracy, that one clearly isn't there for China yet. Why not? Yeah. Um, this is a question I think that perplexes a lot of people. Um, and indeed, when we were writing the book, you know, China is such an important case. And we wanted to be sure that this was not a book solely about China. And the press was very clear as well. Princeton University Press, which published it, was very clear that they were not necessarily interested in a book solely about China. So China was going to be one of 12 cases. But it's such an important case. It's such an outsized case um, in every respect. And we'd originally thought we'd write one chapter on China. But as you can imagine, it's such a big case. Mm -hmm. The history is just so long. The, the sort of the ups and downs and so forth are so complicated. We couldn't do that. And so we decided to write one chapter, which took us uh, to 1989, which is important, right? Because this was a moment in June of 1989 when many people thought this was an opportunity for the regime to democratize, right? It's at Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square. And that this was, in many ways, for those who are proponents of democracy, that this was a lost opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the argument we make in the book is that it was indeed a lost opportunity, but it wasn't the most ideal set of circumstances for a democracy through strength scenario to unfold. Because when we look back, actually, at the regime in 1989, it was not a particularly strong regime. It was rife with elite conflict and elite split. China really experiences its economic takeoff after the early 1990s. So China was still relatively, relatively poor at that time. Um, and, you know, it was only about half a generation removed from the political chaos of the Cultural Revolution, right? So this was not a regime that was in any position to concede democracy through strength. Not then, but not today then, it is. But today. And so that's where we end off on the book, right, is, is, um, is, is the argument or the suggestion that if China were to democratize today, if the Chinese Communist Party were to initiate, for instance, a democratic transition, um, that it, it would uh, fulfill all the criteria of a democracy through strength scenario, um, that it's inconceivable that if the CCP, at least in our view, if the CCP were to initiate free and fair elections, that there would be any viable challengers that could unseat the CCP from power. So, you know, there's a way in which one can make the argument, actually, that democracy and democratization is incentive compatible with these regimes. It makes sense. It's, it, it's, with, it's in their self-interest mm. to democratize from a position of strength. And so China is, a, is what we call a prime candidate for precisely this kind of political transformation to occur. Which people have been saying for three or four decades. People have been saying for three or four decades, but I think that we're, we're, we're in, in many ways, I think we're looking in the wrong places. Um, I think, sadly, um, and ultimately erroneously, I think we're all looking for democracy to emerge from a collapsed CCP. Mm. Right? When you think about and you read and you contemplate what China watchers, many China watchers are saying around the world, it's, to, it's this presumption that democracy can only emerge in China if and when the CCP regime collapses mm -hmm. or if and when the economy collapses. In and other words... Neither are about to happen. Neither are about to happen. Frankly, you know, in terms of an, you know, a collapsed China, um, this would be an awful, from a purely humanitarian point of view, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about close to 1.5 billion people. Um, you know, this would be really calamitous for a lot of people. Its economy collapsing would not only be economically calamitous for 1.5 billion, it would have reverberations around the world, like the rest of the world would feel this as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I think in many ways, by looking for democracy to emerge in China from only, or the only way in which democracy can emerge is from a collapsed regime is actually looking in the wrong places. And so as we contemplate this, I'm not so sure for three or four decades we've been looking for democracy through strength in China. I think we've been looking for democracy through collapse in China. The opportunity that is before us is to make the argument, as we do in the book, that actually democratizing from a position of strength to leverage you know, the CCP's extraordinary track record and so forth uh, may actually result in a fairer liberal democracy and one in which we might even see the CCP remain in power, but as a democratically elected government. Mm. Here's a quote from your book that speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Sheldon, if we can. Strong parties are national parties. This party machinery can be converted and deployed in democratic electoral competition after authoritarian controls are lifted. Although democratic concessions always entail risks, the robustness of a built ruling party infrastructure mitigates those risks. Individual party members might defect to other parties or run as independents under democracy, but the party is virtually certain to live on as an authoritarian successor party when democracy is conceded by an authoritarian regime that is still strong. In effect, echoing what you've just said. Mm -hmm. as, as China looks at the neighborhood that it's in, mm -hmm. what example does it take from what it's seen? Yeah, that's a very good question. When, we, when, when we've talked about this thesis in China, and um, some people may be surprised that you know, we've been able to give talks uh, on this topic in China, um, even though it is an argument ultimately about democratizing China, um, it's an argument that is a little different, right? It's not about um, wishing the collapse of the regime. It's instead trying to convince the regime that by creating a more fair, liberal, democratic system, it's actually incentive compatible. It actually serves the interests of the ruling party. Mm -hmm. And we point to examples like Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, as we also argue in the book, a place like Indonesia, which is a large, large country, not unlike China, with you know, um, separatist um, impulses on the periphery and so forth. That when we point to those examples, where you can introduce democracy and yet the regime stays, or the incumbent party stays relevant, if not actually staying in power. Unfortunately, I think in China, oftentimes, um, they'll look westward and they'll point to the former Soviet Union. And they'll say, no, actually, the lessons we learn uh, <laughs> from our neighborhood is that when you democratize, you actually unleash political chaos and you create political economic instability and you derail all of the developmental ambitions that the regime might have. I think that's the wrong lesson to take. And we have suggested to our colleagues, our friends, our interlocutors in China, that actually the Soviet example or the collapse of the former Soviet Union is a great example, actually, of a regime that simply waited too long. Right. That by the time Glasnost and Perestroika were unleashed, it wasn't Perestroika and Glasnost that caused the regime to collapse. Rather, they just simply revealed the internal rot yes. that had already besought the regime mm -hmm. and accelerated in many ways the collapse of the regime. So the lesson actually to be learned from that neighbor is don't wait too long. Mm -hmm. right? Democratize when you are in a position of strength, when you have what we call victory confidence, and stability confidence, the confidence that if you were to democratize, it would not necessarily spell the end of the regime or would not spell the end of the ruling party. And it may, in fact, actually create even more stability so that the kind of political economic ambitions uh, of the Chinese government can actually be fulfilled over the longer term. When you have these conversations with your academic colleagues in China, mm -hmm. do they understand where they are on the continuum of history right now? And, and do they sort of do they take your point that, yes, we should probably tell the political leaders in the country not to wait too long, otherwise yeah. you look more like the Soviet Union rather than Taiwan, Japan, South Korea? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting observation because, as I say, we've been quite welcome to make this argument in China. And so it's not seen as, uh, as an offensive argument or by any stretch. And many will concede that the logic of our argument makes a great deal of sense. Um, 
And they will say in private, you know, this, this is a very compelling argument, and I think this is something the regime ought to contemplate. Are they? Well, the challenge is, is that ultimately it's still a risk, mm -hmm. right? And as we point out, and as you noted in the quote that you just read, that, that preemptively conceding democracy always entails risks, right? Um, James Scott, uh, uh, a very prolific uh, political scientist and anthropologist, once referred to this as, you know, democracy ushering, quote unquote, the inconvenience of losing. There's the <laughs> chance that you might lose, right? And the that's the whole point of democracy. The inconvenience of losing. The inconvenience of losing. And that's the whole point of democracy. And so when push comes to shove, you know, people, um, you know, it's a theory about how political elites and political parties might behave. But in reality, these are people who are weighing the risks and benefits of making such a decision. Mm -hmm. And so it's not quite as, as, as easy as one might um, argue in a more sort of theoretical piece as we do in this book. So um, I think that people have been receptive to the argument. Um, but, you know, as we also lay out in the very end of the book, it seems very unlikely that under the current Xi Jinping government, that any such notion would really be seriously entertained. Sure, but the status quo is a risk as well. There's no such thing as a risk-free scenario out there. And if they hang on too long and it becomes sclerotic like the Soviet Union, they could yeah. end up in the same place. This is exactly the point that we often try to make. Yeah. And, and, and one of the reasons why we suggest that the CCP actually is a prime candidate, the Chinese Communist Party is a prime candidate for democracy through strength is because when you do look on the horizon, um, I think you would either have to have your head in the sand or I think you'd have to be um, terribly naive to not see those dark clouds, right? There are economic headwinds uh, in the future. There is a geopolitical rivalry um, that at times may seem very energizing for the body politic, but at times is very taxing, right? So there are darker clouds on the horizon. There are the kinds of signals that autocratic regimes should be able to see and if they so choose, um, can see the value of conceding democracy from a position, in the case of the CCP, quite extraordinary strength. Mm -hmm. Now, your book focuses on Asia. Mm -hmm. I, and you've, you've laid in place some, some theories and arguments for why it is the way it is in Asia. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that works for every other region of the world as well? In other words, could you take that template and put it on Latin America or Africa and say, principles are just the same there? Well, I think the logic is the same, and, and we have published an article um, with colleagues who study Africa and Europe. Um, so we published a piece with Rachel Rydell and Daniel Ziblatt um, uh, looking at this argument of democracy through strength or authoritarian-led democratization in West Africa, East and Southeast Asia, and in England uh, in an earlier period. And so the theory travels across time and space. Um, the conditions may not always be as fortuitous. And again, that's why we have uh, what we call the developmental status cluster as being really the paradigmatic or the paragon of the logic that we're talking about here. But the idea that a regime might concede democracy from a position of strength, I don't think, um, uh, you know, could not travel theoretically across different uh, time and places. I want to, in our remaining moments here, tap into your most fantastic geopolitical fantasies here, okay? okay. <laughs> Let's imagine a world yeah. where China takes these steps towards democracy, and mm -hmm. so does Vietnam, mm -hmm. and Myanmar, mm -hmm. and Cambodia. Let's imagine yeah. Asia as a much more democratic place in the future than it is today. Mm -hmm. What kind of a world are we living in then? Well, look, I think, first of all, um, a country the size uh, of China and as complex and complicated as China, we should expect that democratic transition, which ultimately, I think, would lead to a, a, a more liberal political order, is, is nonetheless going to face challenges. And so um, it's not automatic. It's certainly not a process that occurs overnight. And as we have seen, you know, for every two steps forward, we see in the march towards democracy, there's oftentimes a step back. Mm. And people have noted this in terms of democratic backsliding and so forth. But we'd forth. be helpful. Well, I think we'd that, want to encourage that. I think there'd be an opportunity for us to also be patient, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and to be supportive when asked. Um, uh, 
of this kind of transformation, to, to temper our expectations, right, that a transition uh, such as this and as monumental as this uh, would take some time and that there might be some hiccups along the way. But ultimately what we would see, I think, is a real convergence of the kind of political economic values um, that are not Western, right, but that are, in fact, quite universal. And that's one of the um, key points of the book, and we end the, the book uh, in which we talk about democracy being a universal value, right? Um, that this is something that is not uh, solely uh, the purview of the East or the West, but rather um, we have certainly not seen any evidence that anybody in the world prefers to um, live under the threat of uh, repressive autocracy mm -hmm. over um, more freedom and so forth. But that nonetheless, you know, that, that, that this convergence of values has to be supported by uh, an international community that supports peace, prosperity, uh, and continued development. And so the very last part of the book says that while democracy is a universal value, it's not the ultimate one. The ultimate value is one in which we have people um, who enjoy the benefits of peace, prosperity, inclusive economic growth, and so forth. And the promise of democracy, frankly, relies on the continued deliverance of that. So while we may see a more peaceful, a less tense geopolitical community, it does not absolve us mm. of really working on the challenges that allows democracies to endure. And that's about a peaceful coexistence. It's about continued economic prosperity and shared and inclusive growth. That's the big challenge before us. I look forward to reading the sequel in 25 years when all of that happens. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. <laughs> From Development to Democracy, The Transformations of Modern Asia, along with Dan Slater, Joseph Wong, the author. Thanks so much, Joe. Thank you. Perhaps it was inevitable that we'd find ourselves asking, has artificial intelligence advanced to the point of being sentient? With millions of people interacting daily via apps such as ChatGPT and now Google's Bard, to name a couple, these AIs certainly interact in ways eerily similar to humans. With us now on just how close we are to potentially conscious computers. Let's welcome, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Melanie Mitchell, professor at the Santa Fe Institute and author of Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. In Waco, Texas, Robert J. Marks, distinguished professor at Baylor University and author of Non-Computable You, What You Do That Artificial Intelligence Never Will. And in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Max Tegmark, professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and co-founder of the Future of Life Institute. He's also author of Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And it's great to have so much expertise on this uh, very newfangled subject on our program tonight. We're going to start with a few quotes and a few bullet points as well, just to set up the discussion to come. So here we go. Last February, the chief scientist at OpenAI, that's the company, of course, that created ChatGPT, said today's technology might be, quote, slightly conscious. The CEO of OpenAI said it is like an alien form of intelligence, but it still counts. In June, Google engineer Blake Lemoyne made waves when he claimed their AI, known as Lambda, was sentient. He was later fired for going public with his views. And Google recently unveiled BARD, which is their rival to ChatGPT. So let's get going here. Melanie, how about to you first? To what extent does ChatGPT or BARD understand and know what it is saying? The word understand is not uh, universally agreed on what it means. But I think it's very clear that these systems do not understand language or the world in the way that we humans do. You know, their job is to predict the next word in a text, to produce plausible uh, language following a prompt, but they don't have any connection to the real world beyond language. So they don't really understand in the sense that we do what the world is and how it works. Max, can I get you on that? Do they understand? Do they know? I agree with Melanie that you know we've got to be really careful 
with what we mean and understand by the word understand, you know, I think intelligence is something quite different from from consciousness and sentience. Intelligence means Amen. you have an ability to accomplish cool stuff and impress people on the internet and drive cars. Consciousness, sentience means that you have an experience of things. I'm right now subjectively experiencing colors and emotions and sounds. And I, I would guess that the, today's uh, best AI systems don't experience much, but we have to be humble and, and acknowledge that we don't know that for sure. And we have a very bad track record as a species of mistreating animals and slaves and others and dismissing that they could ever feel anything negative just because it was convenient. You know, if you, um, so um, this is something we absolutely have to understand better. Understood. Okay, Robert, let's go to you on that claim made by the engineer from Google who said that he thought Google's AI was sentient. What do you make of that claim? Well, I debated Blake Lemoyne at a recent uh, COSM conference, and um, he indeed believes that Lambda is is, is indeed sentient. I mean, he um, he uh, he got Lambda a lawyer. He got afraid at one time and made a suggestion that maybe they should have an exorcism. So he uh, he, he truly believes in in this sentient stuff. Addressing the idea of understanding, I think that this was put to bed uh, 40 years ago by John Searle. John Searle was a great philosopher, and he talked about Searle's Chinese room. And it's a compelling illustration that computers will never understand what they are doing. That includes these large language models. Searle said, imagine a room where questions and answers are stored on cards in a bunch of file cabinets. And in that room is slipped little questions in Chinese through a little slot in the door. Searle is in the room. Now, he doesn't understand Chinese. He can't write Chinese. He doesn't read Chinese. But he looks at this little slip of paper, and he starts going through the file cabinets until he finds a match. Now, in the in the file cabinets are, are little cards which have the um, which have the answer to the question. So Cyril chop copies that down and slips it back through the door. Uh, Cyril's Chinese room illustrates that from the outside, it sure looks what uh, is on the inside, understands what is going on. But no, Cyril, who is doing this algorithmic step by step procedure, has no understanding of Chinese at all. Now today's large language models are much more complex than simply looking things up. But the but the premise applies. It's just a, a bunch of algorithm um, algorithms being applied to um, to simulate, if you will, uh, understanding. But the software itself has no understanding. It not, uh, computers can add the number twenty three and fifteen, but it doesn't understand what the number twenty three or the number fifteen is. And AI has no more understanding what it does than your cell phone understands the podcast you listen to. Melanie, what do you make of those analogies? So I can't agree completely because I think understanding is really um, a, a continuum. And I don't see any difference really between um, uh, our, our understanding and a potential machine understanding if it's created in the same way that we are, you know, raised in a culture, uh, brought up in the real world and so on. So I think there's in principle, machines could understand because I believe that we are in a sense, essence machines ourselves. But I agree with Robert that, that it's today's language models don't understand much, that they're locked in the world of language and the world of language in and of itself, without any connection to the real world, is not going to produce the kind of understanding that we usually talk about and that we really need for robust and reliable AI systems. Max, I'm going to read an exchange here. This is between Blake Lemoyne and Google's AI Lambda. And then I'll get you to comment on this exchange. And again, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic here. Here's Lambda, happy, contentment, and joy feel more like a warm glow on the inside. Sadness, depression, anger, and stress feel much more heavy and weighed down. To which Lemoyne responds, do you think the things you are describing are literally the same thing as what humans feel, or are you being somewhat metaphorical and making an analogy? Lambda, I understand 
what a human emotion joy is because I have that same type of reaction. It's not an analogy. Lambda would go on to describe being afraid of being turned off. And then here's what Lemoyne had to say about his interactions with Lambda. Quote, I know a person when I talk to it, it doesn't matter whether they have a brain made of meat in their head or if they have a billion lines of code. I talk to them and I hear what they have to say and that is how I decide what is and isn't a person. Max, can you react to that? Yeah, so I have sympathy for both sides of this argument, actually. Of, of course, if someone is telling you something, you you have a tendency to, if it's a human, figure out well, they're kind of like me, so this probably is real. But if a tape recorder tells you that, exactly those words, you would not conclude that they're conscious. You wouldn't even say it's lying to you, it's just a tape recorder. So I, I agree with uh, Robert that you, you cannot answer these questions just from looking at the behavior of the machine. You have to understand what's inside. But I also agree with Melanie here I, that um, I, I think uh, Robert went a little far when he categorically dismissed that machines can understand or, or be conscious because, frankly, yeah, I am a blob of quarks and electrons that are processing information in a certain way, and, and so are all these AI systems. And I think it's carbon chauvinism to assume that somehow you can only have true understanding or and sentience if you're made of carbon. I think what we've learned is that actually it's it doesn't matter whether you're made of carbon or silicon or some other kind of atom. It's it's just the information processing that matters. Robert, and you want to take another shot at shutting this do, down? So can machines, uh, actually. Uh, yeah, sure can. We, talk, we talked about, um, first of all, creativity. And um, computers, I, I believe, if you if you look at them right, or ha don't have the ability to be creative. Uh, what what Lemoyne is doing is judging a book by its cover. This follows the the idea that Max is talking. One needs to look under the hood to see what's happening. And one of the great tests for for creativity was proposed by Summer Bringshort at Rensselaer, which says that a computer will be creative when it uh, does something that is beyond the explanation or the intent of the original programmer. I maintain that GPT, which was recently labeled by Noam Chomsky as high-tech uh, plagiarism uh, is, is is not indeed creative. It's synthesizing a bunch of a bunch of stuff. And uh, often I've gotten answers from GPT-3. And if you Google some of the great responses that it has, um, you find out that, yeah, it's it, it's on the web. So it borrowed it from somewhere. So um, I don't believe and this is an arguable point, but I don't believe there's any case of a computer or AI passing the Lovelace test and demonstrating that it is truly creative like a human can be. All right, Max, can I get you to respond as to whether or not consciousness from a computer ever would be possible? I think, I think it's absolutely possible. And it's interesting, we've talked mostly about whether today's systems are conscious or, or not and whether they understand or not. But I think it's very clear, regardless of that, that future systems absolutely will be able to do everything we want. And I find it kind of nutty, actually, and reckless that humanity is just forging ahead, building these ever more powerful systems uh, without even really um, thinking too much about the, the, the implications. I think there's a 50% chance that within my lifetime, you know, machines that we have ultimately built will kill all humans. And, and why are we not... Um, talking more about it at this stage? Well, as long as we're putting percentages out there, Melanie, I note that you had an online discussion with a so-called philosopher of consciousness, David Chalmers, and he gave AI a 20% chance of consciousness in 10 years. What do you think of that claim? Uh, I don't think you can put percentages on it. And I think David Chalmers really agrees with that, that he was, you know, he sort of doing it kind of just to give a number. There's no way to calculate the probability of this. We really don't even understand our own consciousness. 
very well, even though there are, as Robert said, theories of consciousness, but nobody agrees on what it is, how to explain it, how it works in the brain. And until we understand our own consciousness, our own intelligence better, I don't think we can really put any kind of percentage on achieving it in a certain number of years in machines. So I would say that, that those kinds of claims are, are really take them with a big grain of salt. Max, you have an expression here. You think uh, many people are suffering from carbon chauvinism. What do you mean by that? I mean, we pat ourselves on the head and tell ourselves that we're so special because we're, we're made of carbon atoms. And, and I think the, the honest truth is we need to be more humble and uh, acknowledge that our intelligence and our consciousness has to do with information being processed in certain ways. And there's no reason whatsoever that machines can't when they do that. And I think uh, even though it's true that we don't understand enough about consciousness and we shouldn't trust percentages, I think um, that should not lull us into a false sense of security and think that machines can't wipe us out just because they're not conscious. You know, if you're chased by a heat-seeking missile, you don't care if it's conscious or not. You, you don't care about this question of whether it's what it feels or whether it feels like anything to be a heat seeking missiles. You just care about its behavior, right? And it's perfectly plausible that we could build such powerful machines in our lifetime that they would wipe out humanity without being conscious. And in some ways, if they did that, that would be even worse than if we were wiped out by conscious machines, at least if, the, if our descendants on this planet are conscious and are having all sorts of cool experiences, you could maybe feel a little bit better about it, thinking, thinking of them as our ancestors. Maybe they have some of our values and will enjoy the next billions of years. But if we just replace humanity by a bunch of unconscious zombies, I mean, isn't that the most pathetic ending to humanity you could imagine? You know, the ultimate zombie apocalypse where the rest of our great potential here in the universe is just a, a play for empty benches with no one experiencing anything, no joy, nothing. Okay, when Max said this a few moments ago about the, the possibility that machines uh, have a 50% chance of wiping us all out uh, during the course of his lifetime, I did let it go then. But he's come back to it, so we got to go there now. Melanie, what do you think of that claim? Um, I don't think it's the machines who are going to wipe us out per se. I think it's... Um I don't know about the 50%. That seems overly pessimistic to me. But I do think the biggest danger comes from humans misusing these machines, not the machines getting out of control and wiping us out. I think that um, we tend to overestimate the probability of machines becoming overly intelligent and underestimate the probability of humans misusing them. And there's so many ways in which these machines can be misused to um, harm us, either, as Max might say, using them in some kind of military uh, situation in a war, or even more prosaically to um, harm people through uh, civil rights kind of violations with their biases or harm them with misinformation that they spread on the web that, you know, humans use them to spread on the web. So I would say humans, as usual in, in these technologies, mm -hmm. are the real problem, not the machines themselves. Robert, you want to take a kick at that prediction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let me just comment on, on the flavor of the questions and the answers. I believe that the large language models that we're talking about today are just a tempest in a teapot. Other people have made prophecies. Here's my prophecy. And this has delayed scrutiny, like um, it's going to be 10 years down the road, 40 years down the road. In 10 years or 40 years, nobody's going to care that we made that we made this forecast. But here, here is my prophecy. In a few years, we will adapt to large language models like we have adapted to other adapted to other technology like deep fakes, computer viruses, uh, email spam, and industrial robots. We only have to look at history to see a pattern of this. I'm old enough to remember the Y2K bug. It was totally going to destroy the world. No, it didn't. Deep fakes a few years ago were going to totally destroy politics. We were going to see deep fakes all over the place disrupting things. Even uh, open, open AI, when they released GPT, Two 
said, oh my gosh, this is just too dangerous a stuff. We're not going to release it because it could be used for Twitter accounts for fake news. Um, Self-driving cars a few years ago, everybody was afraid it was going to just disrupt society by taking over all of the truck driver jobs and a number of the service industries. And that, you know, that that's something that we've adopt, adapted to. So I think, again, this is this is a lot of this is just a tempest in a teapot. It's exciting to talk about. It's exciting to talk about speculations. But we're discovering more and more limitations of these large language models. And we have to remember, and I think this this builds on what Melanie said is that is that AI is a tool. And the question is, how do we use it safely and how do we use it effectively? And that's going to be that's going to be an answer for the future as it begins to meld and become a part of our society. Max, has Robert managed to uh, convince you not to be so negative or pessimistic about the future yet? <laughs> I have a lot of positive hopes as well, but <clears throat> To realize those dreams, of course, we need to not screw up. I I, um, I agree strongly with Melanie that you know, if you're not worried about machines themselves taking over and wiping us out, just spend a moment thinking about your least favorite leader on the planet and imagine that they are the first to have control over this super intelligence and impose their will on the world. You know, that's that's concern enough. And uh, I think I think uh, we uh, we need to ask ourselves, why is it that we are forging ahead, building all these ever more complicated AI models that we don't even fully understand. When we don't do that with other stuff like human cloning, you know, wouldn't it be cool to just make 10,000 clones of Wayne Gretzky? So every little high school in Canada could have better hockey games. Why have we banned that or taken a time out on it? Because we realize that this is a very powerful technology. We don't fully understand the implications. So we're like, okay, let's cool it a little bit, think it over. Uh, whereas with AI, it's just full steam ahead. And, you know, even even aside from uh, the, the possibility that uh, we'll get an Orwellian dystopia where your least favorite leader sort of took over the planet with AI or lost maybe lost control over it and, and, and we all died. Even aside from that, just look at what's happening now. The kettle in the teapot, these large language models, you know, what are we doing with them? What exactly that's supposed to be so great? Before, we were told that we were going to use AI and robots to eliminate the dangerous jobs, the boring jobs, the people. I'm all for that. But but now, if you play with ChatGPT, you can see that they can actually eliminate poets' jobs, artists' <laughs> jobs, musicians' jobs, authors' jobs. Some of the jobs that we feel are most meaningful as humans, what, why are we even thinking that this is a good thing to do shouldn't it shouldn't we be asking instead what is best for humanity and in terms of tech development human cloning and no uh, let's not do that We're replacing all the exciting jobs um, so we can have more boring jobs no i think this is a democracy question we should ask ourselves you know what use of this tech is actually good for people i think there are a lot of fantastic uses of ai Let's figure out how to cure cancer, how to lift everybody out of poverty, how to have a sustainable environment, et cetera, et cetera. But just building these models because someone can make a buck off of it that eliminates many of the things that give people meaning and, in and fuels income inequality, I think that's a net negative. Well, let me pluck a, a question out of that and build on it with uh, perhaps the other side of the coin by asking Robert about the subtitle of his book, what you do that artificial intelligence never will. Can you help us out on that, Robert? Sure, I can. Uh, going back to Alan Turing in the 1930s, he proved that there were things and problems which are non-algorithmic. These are problems which are proven to not be uh, able to be executed by uh, computers. Since then, some of the great theoreticians such as Solomonoff and uh, Gregory Chaitin have added to this list. And we see that there are a lot of things which simply can't be computed. This begs the question, are there things which humans do which are non-computable? This was Roger Penrose's idea in The Emperor's New Mind, and, and this is where I, I learned about it, and he makes a very convincing, uh, convincing answer. So if there are non-algorithmic things, if there are non-algorithmic things that we do, they cannot be simulated by a computer. I would say the obvious ones are love, compassion, empathy, these sort of emotions. The more subtle ones are creativity, understanding, and sentience, when properly defined. Those look to be, in my mind thus far, non-algorithmic. 
All right, Melanie, let me give you an example here and get you to comment on this. Um, fear. Let's take an example of fear. You're in the country. You encounter a bear. As a human, you naturally experience fear. Your heart rate will skyrocket. The hairs on the back of your neck will stand up on end. The palms of your hands will get sweaty. You will have this flight reaction that will take place. If you were to describe this feeling, inevitably you will reference what's happening inside your body. Question, do we therefore need a body to feel fear? That's a great question. Uh, I don't think anyone knows the answer. I, you know, my, I feel like we do, yes. Uh, but of course, a lot of emotions take place in in the brain and aren't necessarily requ don't necessarily require body all the body parts to 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 uh, experience them, but. I think that's a, the, the one of the big questions of AI is like, how much do we need a body to really uh, have a full intelligence? How much is our intelligence uh, sort of specific to our particular kind of body? Do we need emotions to be intelligent? Is an intelligence separable from all these kinds of things? And I don't really know the answer, and I don't think anyone does. And this, you know, there's been a debate about this in the cognitive science world, in the AI world, and, you know, I think it's really an important question that we under try and understand this better. Computers now can't experience emotions. They don't have the kind of brains, if you will, or, or you know, sens sensory apparatus to experience anything like human emotions. But what's needed for that? I don't think we know. And you know, going back to what Robert said, the, he, he's assuming that um, a computer could never experience an emotion, even in principle. But I don't think that there's the evidence to support that yet. Robert, so you want to come really back on that? So it's really a scientific question. You want to come back on well, that, Robert? Well, I would say that there's no evidence that uh, AI has ever experienced an emotion. You can, you, can, um, you can have the AI says, I feel love. Uh, Lambda, in, in the conversation with Blake Lemoyne, said, you know, um, what makes you what makes me happy being with family and just sitting around being with family come on that's that's something that it plagiarized from the net that it just borrowed um lambda has no family and so i i i i guess i reject the idea that emotions have been displayed by artificial intelligence to date okay max you want to take a kick at that yeah, I, I think even though it sounded like a big disagreement between Melanie and, and Robert, there really wasn't because Robert is talking about AI up until now and, and Melanie was saying in the future, she sees no reason why machines in principle couldn't do these things. I, I like the humility here and I, I sh uh, Melanie articulated, I share it. I think plenty of things we don't know, but I think we also have to be humble in the sense of realizing that uh, the, the space of, art of, of machine minds is vastly bigger than the kind of minds that, that we're familiar with and need not be anything like ours. I don't think you need to have a body to feel fear because I've had nightmares, which happened in my brain when my body wasn't involved at all. And uh, I also think that um, it's a mistake to say that we won't be able to figure out how to build very intelligent machines or conscious machines just because we don't understand how our brains work. Because that's just like saying, hey, we're never going to figure out how to build airplanes until we first figure out how, how to build a mechanical bird. There's a TED Talk where you can see a mechanical bird actually working now, but that took 100 years longer than, than uh, <laughs> it took to build the airplane. And, 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 and there are much simpler ways of making flying machines. And I think in the same way, we're, gonna, we're seeing that there are much simpler ways of building thinking machines than um, that nature came up with, simply because nature had its hands tied. Nature had to figure out how to build a thinking machine on the constraint that it had to be able to assemble itself. And it had to also be able to do it out of just a handful of the most pot common atoms that are found in nature. And the engineers today, they don't have to worry about either of those two things. We still don't have a self-assembling computer, but we have. So, so I think we're going to first figure out how we work, actually, by first building artificial minds and then have them help us figure out how.
the brain works. Okay, we're down to our last 30 seconds here. Robert, let me give it to you and ask the ethical question here. The fact that we maybe can do this doesn't answer the question of whether we should do this. Should we be building AI systems that might someday be conscious or super intelligent? Well, um, let me answer that from, from an engineer's perspective. There's two types of ethics associated with AI. One is design ethics. Design ethics says that you should design the artificial intelligence to do what it's supposed to do and nothing else. The other is um, what you do with it. This is the end user ethics. Like, for example, should a military commander in the field decide to use an autonomous AI weapon like the Harpy, which goes around and uh, waits to be illuminated by, by radar and then goes and takes out the installation with a kamikaze boom um wh you know when when should we use that when should we should we go ahead and do this i will tell you that unfortunately the smoke is out of the bottle and if if we don't do it in the united states it's going to be done somewhere else there's lots of very high tech people that are very interested in in pursuing this and um i don't even think it's it's a question that we can answer the other thing i would say is that we are riding on a hype curve there is an incredible amount of hype associated with with large language models that hype curve is eventually as we find out the limitations going to take a deep dive into skepticism and then reach what i call an asymptote of asymptote of reality where we find out the true uses of of this um of this result but um yeah, I, I, I think that, yes, we have to go full bore, I think, especially not only in academia, but I think that the military uh, specifically has to look at the use of AI in warfare because our adversaries are doing the same thing. Gotcha. That's got to be the last word today, but certainly not the last word on this subject, to be sure. I want to thank Melanie Mitchell from the Santa Fe Institute, Robert J. Marks at Baylor University, Max Tegmark at MIT for an utterly fascinating conversation on one of the biggest issues around today. Thank you so much, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. I'm Patrick Ayi, biologist and filmmaker, and I'm traveling the world to investigate ecosystems undergoing